Thanks for having me. I'd like to thank uh, RBB and OMSSA for bringing me in today. And I'm going to be talking to you a lot about identity. And I'm going to relate that to a homeless person who's on the screen beside me here. And I'm going to tell you a story that happened a few weeks ago in another province where I was meet, working with uh, social services people and health people who were working with homeless people. And they were educating me about the problems that homeless people have with their identity, some of which I think probably you already know. The first problem was is that most of these people didn't have good government identity. And that was a real problem because they couldn't get jobs, because they, didn't have, they couldn't open bank accounts to deposit their checks into. The second thing that they told me about was that there was a problem with uneven health care services delivered for these homeless people because, again, they didn't have good identity, they moved around, and the health care services information did not track properly with them. The third thing that they told me was that they were actually having trouble actually proofing the identity. I mean, how did they actually get the birth certificates? In some cases, people didn't have them. They didn't even exist. So they go out onto reserves and stuff like that. They'd interview the tribal elders, and that's how they document it. That's a problem. The fourth thing that they told me was that they were, um, they were actually creating a pilot project in one city in, in Alberta, and they were actually storing the identity physically. So once they got the government identity for the individual, they're actually storing it in a locked facility where the, identity, the, the homeless person would come to them, and then they'd release that identity temporarily, and then the homeless person would return it thereafter. And the fifth thing that they told me was just a sidebar story. They said it didn't happen very often, but they'd seen instances where people, like siblings, would try and masquerade as the identity in order to gain access to some physical legal documents that they were entitled to. So while they were telling me this, I was sitting there thinking. I was thinking about the identity, uh, the cracks that they were facing. So, and I'm going to be talking to you today about this. How many times will he have to tell his story? So those cracks that that person was facing are as follows. Their identity silos, their identity theft, and their identity management, all of which I'm going to tell you about in the next few minutes. So today I'm going to be making two cases to you. One is that all of us, including us, we all face these identity challenges, these cracks, to varying degrees. The second one is, is I'm going to make the case that we're at the beginning of what I think is a, a revolution in the way citizens' identity is managed in Canada. So let's get going. So to begin with, identity is all about asking and deciding, like, who are you? Well, let's start with me. Like, who am I? I'm Guy Huntington. But what do you know about me? Well, I'm an old guy. I've got a lot of gray hair. I've been around the block more than a few times. And this last summer, I did a backpacking trip with my daughter and my niece on the West Coast Trail, which is on the west side of Vancouver Island. It's a seven-day backpack. That's us, day one, looking all fresh and ripper and ready to go. This is the real truth, though. This is me with my big gut, my sweat-laden shirt, huffing and puffing, trying to keep up with my two trail buddies. <laughs> this is my wonderful wife of more than 30 years. We love to sea kayak. The other thing you know about me is I love to meditate. So, okay, that's Guy Huntington, a little bit about me personally, but then why am I standing on the stage here in front of you? Well, as Jason was saying, I've led, I've also rescued many large Fortune 500 identity projects, some of which are on the screens beside me here. One of them I'll refer to later on in this presentation. And as Jason also referred, I've also been the identity architect for the last two years for the government of Alberta for the Digital Citizen and Identity Authentication Program. So now I think I'm what I call dangerous, and I actually think I know what's going on in government with respect to identity and citizens. So let's take on the first silo, the first challenge, the first identity crack. And rather than me sort of babble up here and sort of try and explain it, I'm going to use a little animation we put together that's going to explain this. So we have this identity silo, and we have this person out there who's coming in to get their driver's license. They're asked for the name, address, and phone number. They go to the health insurance. They're asked for the name, address, and phone number. They go to the uh, social services, name, address, and phone number. They go to the passport uh, 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 municipal office, name, address, and phone number. They go to the passport, name, address, and phone number. Now at the end of it, that person's thinking, Oh, why can't these folks sort of get their acts together? Why do I have to keep giving the same information over and over and over? Like the homeless person, like us. From, their, from a citizen's perspective, from all of our perspectives, 
were frustrated with this. And the silo problem is worse than what I just described. Why? Because that stick person was carrying around all these physical documents that attest to who you are. So let me sort of give you some examples of that. Whoops. Okay, so we have many departments with three levels of governments. And each of them asks for the same documents over and over and over. So let me give you a practical example. Let's look in Ontario. Let's look at health insurance. And down on the right hand side, you're going to see oh, you need to provide your birth certificate, your landed immigrant status, whatever. So now let's take a look at the good old driver's license. Same deal again. You're going to have to provide the uh, birth certificate, landed immigrant status, passport, whatever. Let's take a look at oh, social services, your ball of wax. And you're going to find out that again, they're going to have to provide the same documents over and over and over. And then we're going to go to municipal housing, so I just took this off of one of the municipal housing sites, and you're going to see down there, oh, I have to provide the same thing. Again, name, passport, birth certificate, whatever, over and over and over. From the citizen's perspective, they're kind of PO'd. Why would I say that? Because from their perspective, they have to provide this information over and over and over, and the information only flows in one direction from them, and it sort of vaporizes up in the air, like here, where you have to provide the name, address, and phone number. And so their identity address is not well defined. So from their perspective, they have to walk through all these doors over and over and over. And they have to provide the same information over and over and over. And like that homeless person, they probably get totally frustrated over and over and over. And so what if we could have just one door that they're going to walk through? And then what if we could walk through one door and would automatically talk to all these different levels of government and all these different departments? And if, what if they only had to tell their story once? Is this possible? Well, it is. Now, before I get to the actual solution, let's probe this a bit more with the, the identity. So, if we've got an identity, like this homeless guy or myself standing on the stage, how are we going to check his story? How do you know that I'm Guy Huntington? Or how do you know it's you? So, you use a process that we call identity proofing. You folks already do that. You take the documents, you look at it, you check them out. That's called proofing. So, to do that, we use different types of documents. Driver's licenses, birth certificates, whatever. There's all sorts of different documents. And we do that. Our governments all over the world have come up with agreed upon standards to do this. It's called identity assurance. And it's a way of measuring risk against the types of documents and the process you're going to use to proof them. So, in Canada, we have four levels of identity assurance. What are they? Low, medium, high, and very high. So let me give you two practical examples of this. And one example, we're going to have a person who is uh, actually going to, you're going to go out, it's going to be you, and it's Christmas season, you're going to go out and you're going to buy a Christmas tree permit to go chop down your Christmas tree. And the other one, we're going to actually log online and you're going to access your medical records in the future online. Two very different levels of risk. In the first level, the first one, a Christmas tree permit, the government does not really care that you are you or the guy is guy. All they care about is the value of your money. If your money is good, they're then going to give you the permit and off you go and wish you Merry Christmas and off you go and chop your tree down. On the other hand, if you are trying to log online and you're going to access your medical records, there's a lot more risk. And so the government, before they give you or me access to that application, they're going to want to know that you are you. And they're going to then use a high level of identity assurance in order to do that. So you have to go through the same types of documents I was showing you before. That's kind of the same thing you'll have to do. So now let's put the story together. If we only have one door to walk through and we're all proofed once, then who is doing this out there in the world? Is anybody doing it? Well, yes. The province of British Columbia. In 2013, not quite two years ago, the province introduced the combination of the driver's license and the health care card where you only go and get proofed once. So this summer in uh, uh, BC where I live, I got an information in the mail because it's about time to renew my driver's license. And they said, Guy, you have to bring in all these types of documents. So I brought them in once and they, the gal at the ICBC counter, the Insurance Corporation of BC was actually doing the driver's licenses. She looked at it. And then she, uh, they, they were valid documents. Then she took a digital picture of me. And that image was then compared against the database to make sure I'm Guy Huntington and not masquerading as somebody else. And then that when I cleared that path, a few weeks later in the mail, I got my card. Now with this card, it is possible in the future to only walk through that door once. And I would, so now if you go back in that animation, I'm Guy Huntington. I walk into the driver's license and I say, you know, here's my card. 
I give you consent to use it. I walk into health services, I say, here's my card, I give you consent to use it. I walk into the social services, here's my card, I give you the consent to use it. I walk into the municipal, here's my card, I give you my consent to use it. I walk in the passport, here's my card, I give you the consent to use it. And gone are the days you have to keep providing this information over and over and over. From the homeless person's perspective, or our perspective, isn't that better? Because then the citizens in control of their information. That answers the first problem, the first silo. So what's the second one? The second one is identity theft. So what's identity theft? It basically answers the question, who are you? Now, I want to set in a context here this discussion. Because if I talk about identity theft, what's the first thing you think about? You think, oh my god, I guess somebody's going to take my username and password and empty my bank account. Or somebody's going to take my credit card and use it maliciously. That's probably what you think about, right? Well, now I'm going to try and, and a little bit scare you a little bit because I want to basically cite this in terms of the 2015 year we're about to enter, where technology is racing rapidly ahead. And to do that, I'm going to show you a video that was produced not quite two years ago in Belgium, of all places. And it was produced by the Belgian Banking Association together with the Ministry of Finance there. And they produced a video that was designed to basically educate their customers about the reality of not just the traditional identity of theft, but of somebody who's actually going to steal their total identity. Now, a little word of caution, it's in Flemish. I know probably most of you don't speak Flemish. It's all in English subtitles. So for the next few minutes, come along with me on a journey and see what's awaiting you as people come up to the counter to deal with you in the future and how you're going to have challenges in identifying them. Ieder van ons heeft naast zijn gewone leven vandaag de dag ook een online leven. Maak je voorstellen, mijn nieuwste vriend. Tom de Grote. Tom zit sinds 2010 op Facebook. Hij heeft bijna 700 friends, waaronder sinds kort ik dus. Hij is 35 en woont sinds jaar en dag in Brugge. Daar heeft hij ook Sophie leren kennen. Zijn het geen schatjes? We stuurden hem een phishing mail, zogezegd in naam van zijn echte bank, met de vraag om enkele gegevens te bevestigen. Eens we die hebben, volstaat nog één neptelefoontje om zo zijn rekening leeg te halen. Maar ik, ik ben iets anders van plan. Want intussen ken ik Tom immers zo goed dat ik niet zijn bankrekening ga overnemen, maar zijn leven. Letterlijk. Tot snel, Tom. Zo, je bent tussen al goed in zijn vuil te voelen. Tijd voor een testje. Ja, we gaan eens dag zeggen aan Krieke, de baas van zijn stamcafé. Daar is Tom kind aan huis, dus ik ook. Toch? Hé, hey, Krieke! West! Benieuwd hoe hij zal reageren als hij zichzelf, of beter gezegd mij, tegenkomt op Facebook. Good afternoon, sir. Sorry to bother you. This is Jimmy from the Harp Hotel in London. Uh, yeah? Yeah, we got your online reservation uh, for four rooms. Uh, excuse me. I didn't, uh, I didn't make a reservation. Paar dagen geleden heb ik online mijn kinderdroom gevonden. Een schitterende antieke harp. Maar ik heb hem natuurlijk niet betaald. Daar heb je vrienden voor. Ah, dag meneer de Grote. Terug. Ja. Staat hij daar goed? Wat is dat? Wat is Wat is dat? Dat is die harp die ik hier juist geleverd heb voor, uh, voor u. Harp? Je hebt hier juist getekend. Ik heb, en waar is mijn handteken? Hier. Hij moet dat Kijk, hij heeft er net al een gebeld van het Londen uh, ja. dat je met een dermame visakaart ding besteld zijn. Ja, dat weet ik niet. Ik weet dat ik hier gewoon niet hier heb afgeleverd. Je hebt hier juist afgetekend. Wat heb je juist afgetekend? Mega? Ja? En wie was dat? Hoe zag die man eruit? Uh, dat was jij. Simpel. Ja, dat was de eigenlijk die boek wel wat aan het Ben ik hier niet geweest? Mag ik mag ik weer meenemen? Dat is... Ik heb je dat niet gevraagd. Ja, maar ik mag die niet meenemen. 
Don't. Is that right there? Kijk dan welke vrede. Wacht. Die is aan deze? Ja. Beste Tom. Tom hier. Aangenaam. Heel je leven staat online. En voor je het weet neemt iemand zoals ik het van je over. Hé, hey, maar dat is freaky. Dat is freaky. Wat de fuck is dat? What the fuck is that, you man? No. Let's go up in it, man. Yeah, man. Deel geen persoonlijke en bankaire informatie. Of jij wordt misschien de volgende. Okay, you're back with me. Now that video illustrated two problems. One is a person physically masquerading as yourself. The other one was somebody who's actually taking your bank account information, your online life, and masquerading as you. Now, I probably share, scared you a little bit, but you're probably thinking, well, okay, guy, but think through all that. Like, how is that going to affect my residents, my clients I deal with? Because you think nobody's going to have the ability to produce these plaster masks, have the person do the latex on the front and color it, et cetera, et cetera. And you're thinking, like, that's okay to scare me, but that's not really practical, is it? Well, now I'm going to show you, uh, are we up there? Good. I'll show you this site. This is a site for $300 US where you can send in two pictures of yourself or somebody can submit two pictures of yourself from the internet, one face, one side, and they'll be instantly able in a few days to deliver a mask that looks just like you and wearable. How can they do that? It's because of technology. So what happens is they take the pictures and there's these things called 3D printers. Have you heard of it? Okay, you've all heard of it. The price point for them are dropping and the performance is increasing. And so right now, that's how they do it. You take a picture, it's fed into the system, it automatically creates a three-dimensional model, they create the, the mask and it's cut and off you go. Now is that mask really realistic if you're up close? Well, no, it's probably not. But my point to you is, is that this technology is evolving so fast that over the next few years, you can predict that for hundreds of dollars or less, people will be able to create these latex masks and do what the spy agencies used to do, like Tom Cruise, the Mission Impossible, where they rip off their masks. That is now going to become possible. So I'm asking you, as a citizen, just like me, how is the government going to protect us when we deal with you at the counter and protect us from people masquerading as us? Or if they're going to deal with you online, how are they going to protect us? Because it's a real risk. So the government team in Alberta, the identity team in Alberta, we began to consider this about two years ago. And we began to think about how we identify ourselves online and ask the question like, who are you? And the first thing we came up with in the today's real world was we use our good old driver's license. It's used a lot. So now I'm going to give you a practical example. Let's pretend it's you and you've got your driver's license and you're in one of the airports in Ontario. The first thing you're going to do if you look a lot younger than me is you're going to draw, go into a lounge and you're going to buy a martini. And they're going to ask you for your ID. You're going to show your driver's license. The next example is if you're going to uh, go to one of those kiosks in the mall, in the, in the walkways, and you're going to buy for MasterCard or Visa or Amex or Aeroplan or whatever, and you're going to sign up for that. They're going to ask for your driver's license again. The third one is when you actually go to get on the plane at the boarding gate. They're going to ask you either for your passport or your driver's license to do that. Now I want you to think about this. This is what the identity team thought. We thought, this is really cool because the government has no idea you're using that. And that the citizen's in control of their identity information and how you use it. And we thought to ourselves, how can we take that same analogy where the government does not know exactly what you're doing with that and apply that in the online world? And there's two challenges we were facing in doing that. One is something that we call identity profiling. So what do I mean by that? If we use the same common unique identifier and we send that out in the electrons from a central source to an application, say a municipal application, and if somebody actually intercepts that unique number, they could then potentially go to another application and figure out all the applications that you've been logged on to. 
so they could profile you. So we didn't want that to happen. That's one problem. The second problem is with uh, online stuff is that everything is logged. And so how are we going to present, prevent the citizen from feeling like big brothers watching over them? Those are the challenges we were facing as we tried to basically recreate the, 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 the way the driver's car is used in physical life in the digital world. So there's several components I'm going to educate you about it. The first one is, is we actually create a unique electronic identifier for the identity. So let's use Jane Doe as an example. So in this central government data store we're going to create, we'll have Jane Doe and she'll give her a unique identifier of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So what? Again, sat in the data store, we're going to store information about Jane, like her name, like her address, like her age, like her sex. And you're thinking, oh my god, you're going to build this monstrous database of everything known about the citizen. Wrong. The only thing we're going to store is tombstone level identity information. We're not going to be storing anything sensitive about her, like your social insurance numbers, your health numbers, your tax information, nothing. That stays in the existing data repositories where it belongs. So we're not going to do that. So as a result, in this central data system, we're going to have Jane's tombstone level identity information, one, two, three, four, five, and her tombstone level information. And then Jane's going to want to deal with the three levels of government. So I've, I've put up here the provincial application, just one, but it could be one or many. It could be one or many municipal applications, and it could be one or many federal applications. For this example, I'll just use one of each. So how are we going to prevent the ability for somebody to profile Jane? Remember the profile, the unique number? So we're not going to send this one, two, three, four, five. Nobody, not even the system administrators of the system, are going to be able to see Jane's unique personal identity number. Nobody's ever going to see that. So instead what we're going to do is we're going to send out to each of these applications different numbers. So for example, with the municipal application, we'll send out, you know, um, uh, WXYZ. For the feds, we'll send out LMNOP. And for a province provincial application, we'll send out ABCD. So that's one way we're going to prevent the ability for somebody to profile you. The second thing is, is that we do not store these, these numbers, which we call UFITs. Don't worry about what we call it. Just all I want you to understand is that in our architecture, we're sending out unique numbers for every application that you access. And we're not going to store these numbers in our data system at all. So we generate them on the fly. If you want to learn about it after, come up and chat with me. I'll tell you how we actually do this technically. But we do not store those numbers at all in our data system. So we're trying to give the citizen privacy. Now what about logging? So in the data systems, we're not going to store long term these UFID numbers, such that nobody will be able to come back and say, Guy, what did you use on December 2nd, 2014? They won't be able to do that. So that's the first component of the architecture. We have a good privacy architecture. But that does not address the problems that that video highlighted, i.e. somebody could masquerade as me and somebody could also then take my account and run off with it. So how are we going to do that? So how do I know who you are? Well, in the old days, even up to today, we look at the person. And when we look at the person, we use our eyeballs and we're using a biometric, a face recognition. We say, that must be Guy. It looks like Guy. But what if somebody's actually wearing a mask like me? And it's going to become really realistic. It's going to be almost impossible for them to differentiate that it's not Guy Huntington who's sitting in front of them or standing there. So what could we do about that? Well, we could, uh, hey, we could use that BC card. That's a good idea. We could give a token, something that they carry. That would make it a lot harder for somebody to masquerade as me. So you think that through. Well, it's not, that's better than not having anything. But what if somebody steals my card and wears a mask? Then I'm hooped again. So what else could we do? Well, I'm holding something all of you carry in your wallets right now. It's a credit card. And on the credit card in Canada, all of us have to enter a four-digit PIN to unlock the card, right? What if we were to apply that to this card? That would then help provide identity management. So we're going to use a PIN, and that PIN could be whatever number you want, one, two, three, four, five, or five, six, seven, eight. And it will actually avoid us having to remember all these stupid passwords we always forget, right? And you're thinking now, okay, so like who's doing this in Canada? The province of BC on the back of this card has a cryptographic module. It's a fancy word for saying it has the ability to use a four-digit PIN. 
Now the province of British Columbia has not activated this, so I've got my card, but I don't actually have a four-digit PIN yet. But over the next two years, that's exactly what they're going to do. Now another thing I forgot to tell you at the beginning is that in BC, there's over one million people that already have this card as of February last year. So by this time, uh, by February of next year, there'll probably be about two million people that are having it. So this is something that's becoming widely adopted. So now if we think this through, that's really good. So now um, there's another problem though. If I'm going to use this card, if you go home and you try and tap this card against the screen, nothing's going to happen because your computer screens aren't tap sensitive. So there's some good news. Over the next few years, the computer terminal vendors are starting to produce screens that are tap sensitive. So that would really help. So you can picture your old mom and dad, or me, I'm an old guy, and I could then take the card, tap it against my screen, enter my four-digit PIN, and now it's me. But what about using these things called smartphones? Now 54% of Canadians already have smartphones. And a lot of us like to do business online, deal with the government online. So how is that going to work? Well, I'm not sure if you were following what Apple released earlier this year, but they released something called Near Field Communication, it's a technical term, and allows you to take your card and tap it against the screen and use it just like you do with the computer terminal I just described. All the other phone manufacturers are ahead of them and they already have that as well. So it's now entirely possible you could take that same physical card and use it to log on online with your four digit PIN. Now I'm going to try and bring this all home and we give a practical example. We're going to look at Alice Stick Person and she's going to first of all use this online. So she's going to walk into a government agency and she's going to enter her PIN. She'll then give her consent for the information to be granted and the person's going to say, oh, how can I help you Miss Alice Stick Person? And she's going to think, gee, that was really good. They actually know me. And now we're going to see what else happens to Alice when she goes online. And Alice is going to then take her smartphone, she's going to log on, she's going to go to a government application, she's going to click on the login button, she's going to take her smart, uh, smart card, tap it against the screen, enter a four digit PIN, and voila, it says welcome Alice. And she thinks to herself, wow, that was easy, and it's hard for somebody to masquerade as me. So, the province of BC is doing this. The government of Alberta is racing to try and, and do something similar to what BC has done over the next year or two. So there's two provinces in Canada that are heading down this track already. So that answers the second problem that that homeless person or us are going to have with respect to identity fraud and people trying to masquerade as you. Now I'm going to go on to the third one. This one's actually the hardest one. It's called identity management. What the heck do I mean by that? It answers the question, how do we get this right? From the citizen's perspective, they don't really care about all this stuff. All they want it to know is it's always going to work, they're always going to be secure. But underneath the hood, there is a lot to be done. And you are going to be involved, if I can convince you. And that involves what I call the heavy lifting. So to do that, there's several components. One is to create this unique identifier, the central repository, the tombstone level information, the privacy architecture. Another is to have the identity proofing and standards, all of which I'll talk about in a few minutes. Then we're going to have the memorandums of understanding. I'll explain that too. And then we have this thing called a federation. And that's what allows the central system to talk to all these different applications at all different levels of government. So let's sort of take them one at a time. The privacy architecture, the central identity data repository, etc. Who's going to manage that? Who owns that? Well, it's the province. Why would I say that? Why is it going to be the municipality? Why is it going to be the feds? It's because the province, by law, manages birth registries, death registries, and name change registries. So the provinces and the feds, long before I showed up on the scene, have been working together and they've all agreed that the provinces are going to be running these data stores. They're going to be actually creating the identities. So you might think to yourself, Guy, that's good, but what about identities that the feds create? Like with landed immigrant status or whatever, work visas. And that's true, that they actually will actually create the documents for that, but each of those citizens will go to the province that they're living in and they'll apply and they'll have their identity registered at the province. So that's something the province has to own. So in the end, you don't have to worry about that. All you want to know is that they're going to do it like BC's done, like Alberta's doing. The next component is proofing and standards. What do I mean by standards? These are technical standards. And they're really precise details of exactly how all this stuff works underneath the hood. So let me just give you three examples. On the screen there, there's a button that says Identity Assurance. 
What's that? That is the standard that describes for each level of assurance, low, medium, high, and very high, exactly what documents are going to be required, exactly what uh, the proofing process is going to be. It's going to describe how children are going to be handled, how name changes are going to be handled, et cetera, et cetera. Another one there is electronic credentials. So if we're going to use like these cards with pins in it, that's where that's, that's all going to be defined in that standard. The third one is on the far right. It's called identity claims. You're thinking, oh, why are you talking to me about claims guy? Like I'm a social services person. I'm not an IT person. I want you to know that because your IT people in your municipality, they need to know this. Why would they need to know this? Because they're going to be getting this information out of the central system, the identity repository. It's going to define exactly how the name's going to be formatted, how the address is going to be formatted, all this kind of stuff. And so you need to trot back to your, uh, your IT folks and say, hey, this guy named Guy is giving a presentation. It's pretty cool. I think we should be talking about this. And we need to basically, once the province gets their act together and gives us these standards, we need to figure this out because then we'll be able to map this information into our existing data systems. That's why. Now that beside that is the identity proofing. Remember I talked about that earlier, about the Christmas tree and the online records? This is probably the hardest part of the identity infrastructure. It's also the most expensive for the province to manage. Why is that? Because you have to have somebody doing all the proofing. So there's four ways to do this. It's not for me to tell the province of Ontario how to do identity proofing. But for your sake, I sort of want to give you four alternatives that they can consider, and one of which you might want to lobby them on. The first one is, is to use the good old driver's license. The people do that now. So like in BC, I went to the ICBC, and that's who did the identity proofing. That's an option. Another one, hypothetically, so I'm not speaking on behalf of the province of Alberta, but in Alberta, They've outsourced a lot of their uh, uh, registries to third parties, so like the Alberta Motor Association or whomever. And I could go in there and I could then get my driver's license and, and, and look up health records, et cetera, uh, um, birth and death registries. So that could be an alternative. A third alternative is to use the health services. Remember those binders? Same, they're doing proofing too, so maybe health services could do it. And the fourth one, hey, it's you. You people are one of the three levels of government. In my books, you're actually the most important. And the reason is, is because, um, the reason is, is because all of us have to deal with you the most often. You're the people who actually touch the identity the most often. So that's something you might want to take back and lobby the provincial government on that maybe you guys could do. It also could become a re potential revenue source for you because the province is probably going to be willing to pay for that. The memorandum is understanding. These are legal agreements, and they're agreements between all these different parties. And they're, uh, you're thinking, well, do I have to have that? Well, yes and no. If you're using Kuram or whatever is going to be, re replace Kuram if Kuram doesn't make it, uh, uh, whatever is going to be, uh, you're, you're not going to have to worry about that because the provincial government will mandate that and you'll have that in your applications. However, if you're a province or a municipality or region like you are and you want to use this stuff, then you have to have these memorandums of understanding. And they actually use the standards. They refer to the standards. So you need to get your lawyers to say, heads up, like this is going to be coming down the pike, so we need to get our lawyers involved. We'll come to the provincial, uh, the federation. So what do I mean by federation? By federation, I mean, uh, I'm going to use the example of Boeing. So uh, about 12 years ago, I led the team at Boeing, and we deployed one of the world's first largest federation projects. So what's a federation? It stands for electronic trust. It means I forgot my password. So. Um, with that, with Boeing, there was hundreds of thousands of people who were calling in. They weren't Boeing employees. They were airline customers, et cetera, who were calling in because they forgot their Boeing usernames and passwords. I walked into rooms where there was about 100, 200 call center people just handling those calls. So I'm going to give you a practical example of before and after. The before one, let's pretend you're a mechanic and you work at Air Canada, and you happen to work on Boeing planes. Let's pretend it's a 767. And so you're going to walk in the hangar, and you're going to log on before they did this, you're going to log on using your Canada credentials, and you're going to be successfully authenticated. And then you're going to click on the Boeing app, and of course you're going to forget your Boeing username and password. And that means you're going to have to call up the help desk people, the people I saw in those rooms. You're frustrated. You're not happy. Your airline, Air Canada, is not happy because your productivity is down, and Boeing's not happy because they have to pay the freight for this. So now let's go back to the uh, uh, analysis. So, oops, I went, went too fast. So now let's ta talk in after they did electronic trust. So they got the lawyers together, they signed the memorandums of understanding between Air Boeing and the airline, 
And then what happens is, is that you go into uh, the airline, you log on as an Air Canada employee, you click on the Boeing link, and in the blink of an eye, electronic trust is established such that you don't have to log on again. You don't have to remember the Boeing username and password. Air Canada sends to Boeing information about you, your planes you work on, and all of a sudden you're granted access to the application. You're instantly happy. Boeing's happy because they are able to reduce their help desk costs by millions of dollars a year, and the airline's happy because your productivity is up. That same technology has been used rapidly by the insurance industries across uh, North America. It's also been used by the automotive people across Canada, uh, North America, and it's also been used by the good old governments. So here's one, your identifier, your tombstone identity data, and you've got these three apps, provincial, federal, and municipal, and you're gonna send these UFIDs over to them, and the way it's gonna be done is something called SAML. You're thinking, oh, guy, don't bombard me with all these acronyms. All I want you to do is go back to your technical people and say, hey, we need to get involved with the SAML stuff because that's the technology that's going to allow us to basically take this data and pass it into our systems. And there's a low cost way of doing it. The government of Canada, the government of Norway, the government of New Zealand, and the province of Alberta all use a low cost tool called ForgeRock, open source code to do this. So you want to go back to your IT folks and say, hey, maybe we should work on that. Okay, I'm nearly done with you. I want to talk about sharpening up your commitment. So you need to decide who's going to be involved. You need to take this video, and you're not going to remember all the stuff I've just thrown at you. You need to go back and you need to say, this is stuff we need to work on. You have to have the Provincial Privacy Commissioner. This is just an FYI. They have to be involved. You have a Provincial Identity Service. And uh, you have to get your technical lawyers all involved. So these are things that you need to do when you walk out the door and you think, hey, this is really interesting. We need to get involved. Now, I'm going to uh, give you with a last example. And we're going to have a person that's coming from Alberta, and they're uh, going to the Ontario Emergency Room. And uh, unfortunately, they're sick. And what's going to happen is they're going to tap their card against the screen. They're going to enter their four-digit PIN. And they're going to then provide their consent. And instantly, their health record's going to be downloaded. The doctor's going to say, gee, thanks a lot for giving me your medical records. And you're going to think, I didn't have to provide the, the medical history over and over and over. Is that possible? I chose Alberta for a very specific reason. Next year, they're going to be the first province in Canada to offer an e-health portal online where the citizens are in control of the information. This is totally doable in conjunction with the work that the identity team is doing. So now I'm going to talk to you about Guytopia. So on the team, they, I have a visionary and a doer, and the team teases me a bit. And they say, Guy, whenever you start talking about vision, we think of utopia, and they call it Guytopia. So now I'm going to give you three examples in the vision of where this is going to change our world. One is that we're going to have the ability to do digital signatures. Now, they've been around for a long time, but how many of you use them? Not many. Why not? Because the parties can't identify you online. They don't know you are you. So with these identity cards from BC and et cetera, this will become a prime tool to do that. It will rapidly change the way we work across Canada with banks, with loans, with mortgages, land titles, everything. Another one is electronic credentials. So in the future, I can see that there will be the ability to have all this online on your phone and not actually have to carry a card. The third one is going to change the way we work. So if I'm going to give you, I'll give you an example. If I'm going to get a passport, I'm not going to have to go to the passport office in the future. If I've already got my, my, my BC card and I'm already authenticated and I've already gone through the proofing process, I'll log on to the federal government passport in the future. I'll, prov I'll provide my consent. I'll say transfer over the digital information plus my uh, uh, photo. Then there's the guarantors. They'll be done by using digital signatures. And all, that will radically change the way governments work with their customers. So take that idea and apply it to your own municipality. All those processes, all this is possible. I'm going to end where I began. I asked the question at the beginning, how many times will I have to tell my story? The answer should be obvious. With my consent, I'll tell my story only once, anywhere in this wonderful federation we call Canada. Now, your sector, social services, together with health, in my books, are the two most valuable sectors that care the most about identities, citizens, residents. And I also believe that you guys are the, the main driver of the future, that you're best positioned to manage the citizens' identity and their privacy on a day-to-day -day basis out of anybody in the government services. Thanks very much for having me.